and Filos Popovich. Uh, he did his actually undergraduate work at Queen's University, just sort of down the road, and then uh, did his uh, master's and PhD at MIT, and he's now an associate professor at Boston University, although he's on sabbatical this year, where he's spending some time at, what do we call it, if I'm pronouncing it correct, is it I A R? How is it actually pronounced? Yeah, yeah I R Labs. I R Labs. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. Uh, of which he's a co-founder. Okay, and he's he's uh, he's uh, there were a number of awards, including a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. I'm not sure we have that. Before. I mean, I know we have inventors. I'm not sure whether we have the National Academy. But anyway, uh, he's doing a lot of work on on uh, photonics um, and. Um, work on chiplets, which I haven't heard that phrase, but I'm looking forward to hearing about it. So please okay. join me in welcome. Um, let me just check in case we just take it with people online to make sure that I don't leave them in the dust. Um, can uh, people hear me on the uh, on the Zoom? I think they can because the uh, microphone is flashing. So hopefully that. It is good. Uh, let's see. So uh, yeah, thanks uh, very much, everybody, for for coming uh, and for having me, uh, and and John for inviting me uh, to uh, to visit you. So um, I work on integrated optics. Uh, this is a, I guess a, a quantum seminar, and so maybe it's a little bit. Um, uh, this will be a little bit um, application level. Uh, I had too many slides and I took some device level things and put them after because I thought it'd be interesting to give uh, sort of, you know, uh, for discussions or, or whatever, if people want to stick around. But um, I'll, I'll give you a, a higher level perspective on, on what I've been doing with photonic integrated circuits. Um, so uh, I, I titled this uh, uh, Electronic Photonic Integrated Circuits and Systems for AI Quantum and Sensing Applications. I'll tell you uh, why uh, AI, because uh, integrated photonics is being used in industry, but uh, you know it's not uh, chips with zillions of components the way that uh, electronic chips uh, have you know, billions of transistors. Intel sells uh, pluggable transceivers for data centers, and there's a chip on there and it has like four optical modulators on the you know huge chip. That's sort of the scale of these things. Uh, and what I'm gonna be talking about is sort of the equivalent of VLSI, very large scale integration, uh, integrated photonics. And that's in a second wave that's now uh, sort of on the, on the cusp of, of uh, entering actual uh, use, let's say. Uh, we'll see if it actually does or doesn't, you know, it's always like, near, but it's not as bad as cold fusion always 50 years away. I mean, not cold fusion, real fusion. Cold fusion is a different thing. Anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, so um, the reason why I mentioned AI is that uh, artificial intelligence is, you know, whether you think uh, it will have a lasting massive impact or is sort of going to be big for a little while and then sort of slow down. Uh, it is the driving force behind all of the highest performance microprocessors and the scale of compute being installed in data centers. People are trying to train and fine tune and then run uh, these large language models uh, and other uh, AI uh, systems, um, you know, kind of like Google was trying to do in the mid nineties for search zillions of people putting in queries, and now you want to have these LLMs basically sort of uh, put this uh, machine capability uh, in, into various uh, jobs. So optics has a role to play here because um, there's you need a huge amount of computation and you need a huge amount of data flow because uh, processor chips add and multiply. They don't move data from, uh, from the multiplier to the memory where it's sitting there. Memory chips are separate, and you need huge bandwidth between processors and memory. So, in classical, if anybody does uh, scientific simulation, you'll know that it takes a lot of coding to, and you love it when uh, you know your memory is right next to your processor, and when your processor has to go to the next processor's memory already, that's way slower, 
and that limits the scale of what you can do. And with these, these uh, AI applications, you really basically want the whole data center to be one large processor, and that can only be done with optics. Uh, and you cannot use uh, these pluggable transceivers or this scale of inter uh, optical communication equipment that's used for, let's say, fiber to the home, or even for data centers where you go from one server to another server. And that's because the whole conversion from the uh, electrical signal domain to the optical signal domain uses, um, so they go to high speeds, the signal is very weak, then they use a lot of DSP, digital signal processing, to sort of you know, get uh, the signal to noise ratio or, or the bit error rate down. And what that means is the data throughput is huge uh, or is fine, but, um, but there's a large latency because you have all this computation that you have to do. And so you have to strip away all of this stuff that costs you both latency and energy. Um, and and if, if you want to get terabits and terabits out of every processor package and between all CPUs. And integrated optics has a big role to play in this. So, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. And it probably, and so I know there's a lot of quantum people here and this is a quantum seminar. So at the end, I have a quantum story. Uh, it's something that I'm working on, but actually uh, I'm not a quantum person. I've, I've spent the last almost decade trying to learn more about it, just in the process of, uh, you know, trying to contribute a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, I don't need to do the Moore's Law thing, except uh, one interesting fact. Um, so in uh, the early 90s, uh, the world's fastest supercomputer, that's the red line, uh, was as fast as your iPhone is in your pocket. Just to, to illustrate the scale of improvement of, of um, transistors, and this is the sum of all the computers. Um, and, uh, you know, another way to look at this is how many transistors are on a single piece of silicon. By the way, single chip can only be two by three centimeters in size. That's all of the infrastructure trillions of dollars invested our optical equipment projecting a mask down to an inch by inch piece of silicon. So if you want more area, you have to make multiple separate chips. And there are now companies like Cerebrus, and I'll show you a picture, making these wafer scale processors where they sort of never dice up the chip into separate uh, chips. They stitch together and try to make an interconnect between all of these uh, little reticles on the wafer, but these are the exception rather than the rule. Uh, but anyway, huge increase in the count of transistors. The, the only reason why I want to show you this is uh, that's happened in part by reducing the size of the transistor from you know five microns to five nanometers, factor of a thousand in twenty five years. Um, and you know that's so it used to be a MOSFET looked like this, and you know then uh, kind of like this in twenty five nanometer technology. So this is the polysilicon gate, the uh, crystalline silicon body of a transistor. So you have source drain and this is the channel and you apply voltage here and you know here the uh this channel becomes conductive or not that's how mosfets work and you get a billion of them and then nowadays the latest technologies three nanometers are gate all around uh so that you can um you have basically a channel going this way and you apply a voltage between the middle and the outside so you have the the um cleanest on off switching um in the smallest size so anyway three nanometer transistors so a factor of a thousand. <clears throat> what I wanted to say about this is just to compare it to integrated optics, which is, uh, so ring resonator, somebody said the word, that's a kind of a, a building block of, let's say, of some, you know, a large class of uh, integrated optical circuits. And the first ones were thought up already in, in, in Bell Labs uh, in some patents in the late sixties and people played with them, but, um, they can become small, but you can take tight turns when you use high index contrast. So silicon surrounded by an oxide uh, as a large index contrast system, three to one refracted index ratio, that allows you to go to micron scale rather than sort of centimeter scale resonators. Uh, the first one was demonstrated in the mid nineties. So I showed you the transistors in the mid nineties. Uh, and then uh, if you look at transistors around today, uh, sorry, rings around today, five micron radius, five micron radius. So there's no scaling. And it's because these are, you know, their, their, uh, their performance is determined by Maxwell's equations. They work on the scale of the optical wavelength and the refractive index determines the confinement and so on. Uh, but there is kind of a scaling law that has changed what we can do with optics. 
and that is uh you know everybody uh <clears throat> that uh that does something in physics that uses the Fourier transform so this was you know um thousand x reduction in the spatial scale so if we take the Fourier transform that would be uh the spectral domain the first rings were uh q q factor of 250 and you know now or, or 500 and now you have 500,000. So there's been a change in, in a factor of a thousand in the optical loss in the uh, uh, optical line width that you can um, that, that you can realize. And you know, for example, the bandpass filter bandwidth that you can create. And this is sort of a, a performance metric for what you can do. You don't need a you know a, a one uh, gigahertz line width only if you want to make a one gigahertz filter. You need a one gigahertz intern intrinsic line width. Uh, that's sort of uh, descriptive of the losses inside, even if you want to make a 50 gigahertz bandwidth filter, but with low loss, the, the sort of ratio of the bandwidth to the intrinsic line width tells you uh, something about the, the performance level of the device. So you can, but it, and it also limits sort of the ultimate line. Width. Um, so there are optical communication systems where you can make bandpass filters out of these. You can make optical modulators and detectors that are wavelength selective and compact because you wrap around sort of a lot of optical path length into a, a small uh, physical uh, space and so on. And actually, you know, there uh, in silicon photonics, you can even make uh, these are resonators that have cues of the order of five to ten million, so even higher than this. Um, still in silicon and sort of CMOS platforms. Um, I want to put up my uh, advisor because. Uh, he, he died uh, 30 years ago or 20 years ago last year. Uh, and I just thought it was interesting uh, because he, he got into integrated optics in the early 90s when, uh, you know, at the time I showed you. By the way, uh, if you're interested, very interested to learn uh, just some of his thoughts. He had a, prepared a, uh, an after dinner talk for one of these Gordon nonlinear conferences for that year. And he died before he could give it, but he had it prepared. So we sent it to this Journal of Modern Optics and Bob Boyd, somebody mentioned they were working with Bob Boyd, was editor at the time. So he just had it published. So I, I think it's interesting. I just thought a uh, sort of side comment. But um, so this was one of these early papers Brent Little and House uh, wrote on, on these ring resonators in 95. And, uh, and, and Brent asked House at that time, well, you know, when do you think this will be an industry? And the answer paraphrased roughly was about 10 years. It hasn't been quite 10, it's been almost 30. So, you know, uh, things take longer than you think. Um, but uh, let me, uh, okay, so I'm gonna skip some of these things. Uh, I told you the story, oh yeah, that's my group at BU uh, and some collaborators. So let me, uh, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about more about this AI stuff, but uh, just a bit about, um, Kind of research I do. So I'm a device designer at heart and a theorist at heart. So maybe I feel some camaraderie with you. Uh, but I spent uh, the better part of the last 15 years uh, working on devices that enable some sort of system demonstration, cir circuit and system level uh, solution for this or that problem. And so uh, I'll tell you about these data communication, but some of the other things we're doing are also uh, not digital data communication, but analog links where you take an RF signal and put it onto an optical carrier. And that's a way to, for example, uh, fifth and sixth generation wireless, when you have many antennas uh, on an optic, uh, on a RF based array antenna, which is beamforming, trying to find multiple user cell phones, things like that. Um, you would have to have, uh, there's a lot, it takes a lot of power, optics can help that. Uh, then, um, one interesting thing with the coming compute demands, it's a little bit more pie in the sky, is superconducting electronics based on superconducting logic. So uh, Josephson Junction based uh, so-called RSFQ logic um, is orders of magnitude more efficient than CMOS, but there's no memory at 4 Kelvin. And optics, if you can get the data out, you can basically make a von Neumann architecture computer out of this technology. Um, and uh, then tell you a little bit about the quantum electronic photonic systems on chip. So this all this stuff has to do with combining optics and electronics. Uh, this thing here is about making optical apertures um, of a new kind, uh, sort of optical phase arrays, but uh, maybe in a, in a different way than people do it. 
Uh, but I won't have time to talk about it today. So I have my slides after the talk. I just I didn't I didn't pick and choose, I guess. Um, just some pictures, since I won't be talking about individual devices of the kind of things we're doing. So we build, you know, uh, rain resonator based modulators out of silicon. So this is a, a MOS capacitor modulator. There's a, a, the gate of the transistor, which is a one nanometer thick oxide here. That's where the charge collects and the light goes around. And so if you put in charge, you know, it moves the resonance. And so that's how we electrically control the resonance and, and uh, encode information. And then we built, for example, uh, gratings that uh, send light in only one direction by engineering multiple levels here and things like that. Uh, I was just telling uh, Boris, uh, um, somebody's interested, the adiabatic evolution is a big thing in many physical systems in, in physics. Uh, in optics, we use adiabatic evolution often to build um, uh, devices that are invariant to different things. And uh, this is a device that's um, a new kind of uh, adiabatic evolution concept that doesn't occur rent sort of in nature because you have to specially engineer how the potential evolves, which doesn't by, happen by accident. So I call it rapid adiabatic evolution. So I have slides on this too, but I won't talk about it now. Uh, but, um, and then um, magic keys, uh, uh, new types of cavities and things like that. So it gives you an idea of what my students work on. Um, okay, so the three topics I, I chose to talk about today, well, first give you a bit of an introduction to monolithic integration of electronics and photons. It's kind of an applied topic, but I think it's interesting for you to know uh, what's happening. And, and then uh, I'll, I'll give you a summary of uh, this millimeter wave uh, RFD forming, the cryogenic interconnects and the quantum. So then I'll skip over the millimeter wave quickly and, and focus on these two, because that might be what's most interesting for people. Um, I'm not diving deep into any one device, uh, but uh, you know we, we can. Um, so um, you know uh, why monolithic integration on a single chip of transistors and photonics? This this is by the way something that's uh, unique in what uh, I and a colleague of mine who's at Berkeley, Vladimir Stoyanovich, and and another guy at MIT, Rajiv Ram, uh, did. That's sort of unique in in our field, at least. Um, uh, at least it was, and now it's being done more, and may maybe it'll be supplanted soon and sort of run out of fashion again. But um, uh, most of integrated optics, you design photonic devices, you, you either build them yourself or send them to a foundry, but basically the chip has only optics. And we tried to uh, build optical devices in an existing CMOS foundry process that can yield a billion transistors on a chip. And the reason for this is that optical components, especially resonators, are extremely sensitive to everything. So you need to have a control system around every resonator in order to, for this to be able to scale to the hundreds of uh, devices uh, to make a little system on chip and do something useful. And so, uh, you know, there's precedents of people messing around and trying to do things in CMOS. So I'll just give you here a little bit of a timeline. CMOS means digital transistors, MOSFETs, uh, you know, a bunch of them on a chip. But uh, basically all it is, is um, you know a bunch of transistors and then a bunch of dielectric and metal levels that interconnect them because you have only one layer of transistors to create complicated circuits. You cannot do it with a single level of, of metal interconnect. There's like seven or eight levels of interconnect in a in a modern uh, uh, microprocessor just for power delivery and, and all the interconnection to to create the circuits. So, but that's what you got. And then people said, well, let's use these backend interconnects to make uh, inductors. So it's not really even an idea, but it was an idea in the sense that it enabled um, in RF circuits you need uh, um, inductors, and you know you'd have to sort of put them off chip on a board or something like this. But when you, once you could make an inductor in the chip, you could make uh, complicated and, and scale to many uh, RF circuits, and so people made CMOS radios. And even though bipolar technology was the um, sort of the, the go-to technology for, for analog circuits, CMOS took over once you could do this because it's inex inexpensive. And so, you know, all your cell phones have CMOS um, radios, not, not bipolar uh, chips. Uh, and then, um, then this is not that even that long ago, like early 2000s, uh, people built transmission lines. And so then they could do uh, uh, millimeter wave amplifiers and things like that. And um, 
So what this enabled is, for example, the next generation uh, wireless technology, both for military things like radar and whatever, and for uh, communications like Ericsson puts up these, you know, um, towers for for the, for um, for wireless. They're trying to do, go to higher frequency so they can serve more users with higher bandwidth and beamform and find your phone and things like that. And so that's going to be in the sort of uh, twenty to to eighty gigahertz kind of frequencies, right? And so so um, a lot of these components will be on silicon chips. So the idea was, can we put optical modulators, detectors? things like that in a process that can yield a billion transistors. And why do it? Because you can then build whole systems on chip. Um, so uh, yeah, we spent a decade taking out different chips and, and uh, th that was pain a painful experience, but I'll just show you the, uh, the outcome. By the way, it's a hard thing to do a PhD in because you know when I was doing a PhD, you learned Maxwell's equations, you figured out how a ring resonator works, you uh, a couple mode theory level, you do like maybe circuit level models and design of the component that you want. And then you design the devices. Somebody else does the layout, fabricates it. You've got your device, you measure it, that's it. If you need to build a system on chip, now my students, besides these things, learning e &M, have to learn about uh, CMOS technology and transistors and uh, process design kits. And they have to interact with the foundry, understand what the foundry engineers are talking about. And they don't understand optics and things like that in, in, in turn. Uh, and all kinds of things to do with uh, chip design. So anyway, there's a lot if you want to uh, to be able to design one of these uh, electronic photonic systems, which makes it hard to both, you know, do deep work on a single device and and uh, push it up to like a system level. But that's the kind of thing we have to struggle with, I guess. Um, anyway, if you cut one of these chips in in a cross section, here's the uh, N and P type MOSFET transistor. And so we're reusing uh, the uh, either the body of the transistor or the polysilicon gate or both in the case of let's say some of the gradient couplers um, also for for light. So um, and here you can see a cross section of that uh, MOS capacitor ring modulator that, that I mentioned to you. So uh, so this was kind of actually uh, a hacker. Uh, um, <laughs> um, activity in the sense that IBM didn't know we were doing this in their fab. We just would meet the design rules, go on a multi-project wafer run along with other writers who were circuit design groups that do their PhDs on new types of A to D converters or whatever circuits people do. And mm -hmm. we would uh, design this, meet all the design rules, pass the design rule checks, chips would come back. And the only thing we have to do is remove the substrate, of the silicon substrate, because uh, the offside under the waveguide was too thin. Uh, if you want uh, to confine light in a waveguide, you need a couple of microns of oxide at these wavelengths so that you don't couple into the high index substrate and radiate all the light down there. Uh, and uh, that's done in silicon photonics kind of uh, fabrication facilities. But in CMOS technology, you need the silicon substrate nearby because all these transistors need to conduct heat into the substrate and you don't want to put a huge oxide uh, thermal insulator uh, in between. So anyway, so that was... Uh, sort of on the way, but then it, eventually we started we started this company that John mentioned, and we started working together with global foundries who bought IBM's semiconductor business in the meantime. And so this process became translated uh, and, and they optimized it for photonics. So now it's sort of, at the time we didn't have germanium, which is an absorber at uh, 1.5 micron wavelength to uh, use as a detector, because you need both uh, uh, transparent material for waveguiding and an absorbing material for for uh, for a detector. So it turns out that the uh, P-type MOSFET had a silicon germanium alloy in the source and drain regions to uh, squish the channel and increase the mobile carrier mobility in these small process nodes. And we reused that as a detector, but you have to use it at these weird wavelengths, about 1100 to 1200 nanometer wavelength, not quite the telecom wavelengths. So then they added germanium, and so you have these transistors. They don't actually work quite as well uh, in photonics because you know trade-offs when you when you add sort of a specialized photonics process. But anyway, now you can you can design in this process. It's commercially available, um, and um, so uh, this is kind of old work now. Uh, let's see, what's going on? Uh, so. It's been a while already, but so we built a microprocessor as a demonstration. So it has two uh, cores, and then here 
you have integrated optics that uh, make the microprocessor talk to memory. And this here is uh, sort of an emulation for, for memory. It's a, uh, you, you won't, CPUs talk to DRAM memory, but this is uh, static RAM because uh, DRAM are these long capacitors anyway. Uh, so we had two of these chips and they would talk to each other. And so uh, the way that it would work is these two vector cores. Uh, by the way, anybody heard of the company Sci-Fi? It has a presence here. They do a uh, new kind of architecture of, of processors. So their first processors are these because uh, we had free space and said, hey, you want to put some cores here? <laughs> we'll put optics next to it uh, just by accident. But um, so what you see in the optics here is actually this is not visible very well, but it's a waveguide. And then it has 11 ring uh, based modulators over here. Actually, here you can see one. So the light goes in, modulator goes out. And then this is a tap that if the uh, light is on resonance, a little bit of it goes here to a photodiode so that we know that there's light in the resonator. And then there are circuits here that lock the cavity, that thermally tune its wavelength so that uh, it stays uh, on the wavelength of laser. And I'll explain to you in a minute why, why, why you do that. Uh, and then these are uh, drivers for the heaters and for the high-speed data signal. And this here, this grass stuff is digital logic and so on. So then you replicate this 11 times because the light coming in is uh, 11 wavelengths. So wavelength division multiplexing on one optical fiber, and it goes through, it comes out. So this was the world's first microprocessor that spoke to the outside world using uh, optical communication. Uh, and um, so uh, I don't know if I have, why do I be quick? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so this is sort of two of these connected. And so, you know, we could run Hello World, boot Linux, and I made a little uh, rendering demo and things like that. So there's a seven minute video you can watch about it. Um, so then then um, from 2015, around that time, we started IR Labs. And um, this is a chiplet that I'll show you in a minute uh, that basically is next to a high performance processor. In this case, it's Intel's um, highest end FPGA from a couple of years ago. It's called the Static 10 now. The, newest versions are called Agilent series anyway. But um, so these are FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, which are programmable processors. And um, so they, they need a lot of bandwidth. So there are five of these chiplets. And what they do, I'll show you in a, in a next slide, is uh, all the electrical domain data here gets encoded onto um, uh, optical and comes out of optical fibers through these chiplets. So, the big thing happening in uh, microchips these days is this chiplet paradigm, which is not just for, for op optical I.O., which I'm talking about here, but for various functions. For example, um, uh, it started a few, a few years ago, but recently with AMD uh, saying uh, TSMC is the world's biggest foundry. We're going to build digital logic in three nanometer uh, the three nanometer node, it's super expensive. So we, we should not be taking up chip space with uh, IO functions or uh, memory or whatever. So the, they, they have one chip, which is the memory, another chip, which is the digital, digital logic, another chip, which does something else, uh, or the GPU and the CPU, for example. And so uh, chips have, uh, processor chips have gone from a single piece of silicon in just a package with pins uh, to multiple silicon chips on a substrate uh, so advanced packaging. And so these little chips around are called chiplets. So they can be, for example, so-called HBM, high bandwidth memory. So if you watch NVIDIA a couple of weeks ago, gave a talk, I'm sure everybody's aware from the TV news and stuff that NVIDIA went over a billion in valuation. Six or seven years ago, they were 10 million valuation. Um, and they announced their, so Jensen Huang, their CEO, gave like an hour and a half talk or something. So if you can sit through it, you'll see what they're doing. So they, they uh, unveiled their latest uh, GPU, graphics processing unit, Blackwell. And if you look at that, you will see it's a it's a big board and there are two big uh, processors, but they're actually packages. And then there's a, like a chip and lots of little memory chips around it. So that's what these chiplets are. And so we're building a, an optical communication chiplet that can basically make it have no difference whether you're talking to uh, another processor next to you or a football field away. Because once you pay the price of going into the optical domain, optical fiber losses are 0.2 dB per kilometer. So, you know, 100 kilometers, 20 dB loss. Okay. But five kilometers, one dB, that's not. So 
it's a pretty pretty large area you can sort of make synchronous. There is a latency of about a nanosecond per meter or so. And so, you know, that's that is something you take into account. Um, so, um, oh, I see, that's what happened. Um, let me just skip through this stuff. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, okay, one, one of the, so why, why optical in a, in a connection? Um, so one, you cannot make the processor bigger. They already are taking up the whole silicon reticle and you need more compute. And it needs to be all uh, seeing uh, all the memory sort of as local memory. The other part of it is that um, the uh, total power that one chip package can handle has been growing, but not as fast as the power for communication of all the data you need because the processors get faster. And as they can multiply and add more, for every multiply and add, you need to bring in the X and Y and take out the Z answer. Uh, you know, the memory is where it goes. So you have you need more and more bandwidth. And as that's been growing, that's actually been going faster. So um, this is 2020 something. So basically all of your power that the package can handle is going to be IO. So that doesn't work. And so you need a new technology to uh, to support this scaling. So, and the reason to go optical is that um, the way electrical communication goes to higher bandwidths is higher speed. And that's very painful. And at frequencies already of a few tens of gigahertz, metals become lossy, you don't, can't go a very far distance. But more than that, you have to go from the, you know, all the processors in 2005, we're going one or two gigahertz. All the processors in your laptops right now, still one or two, three gigahertz. So that wasn't the case before 2005. There was a Moore's law scaling. And then because of power, it stopped. And then you went to multi-core and all these other, other ways to keep getting more performance, right? More, more uh, transistors on a chip, but not higher clock frequency. So increasing clock frequency costs you power. And uh, with, uh, with light, you don't have to increase the clock frequency. You can have multiple wavelengths and they can all go down one wire. And uh, you, can all, you can go an infinite distance almost. And so that's the that's the the reason why it, um, it works. Uh, so the way it works is um, go from one processor, uh, parallel electrical connections go to this triplet, and then this data gets modulated onto wavelengths, uh, and then goes optically to another triplet. And uh, uh, the light source uh, for this is not in the silicon chip. Why silicon doesn't emit? It's an indirect band gap semiconductor. People are trying to put three five semiconductors in here, Intel does that. Uh, what we're doing at IR Labs is, uh, is a remote light source. The reason for this is that this here is in the package together with a microprocessor. This is a very high power thing. We just talked about the limits of what a package can handle. So you want all of the power you spend to be spent on com computation. A laser wall plug efficiency, meaning the fraction of power out in light compared to what you're drawing from electricity to power it is 10% at best. So most of the power in a laser is heat. So it's not a very good thing to put in here for power efficiency. It's also not a very good thing to put in here into the power processor package for the laser's life because that's the thing that fails most easily. Lasers don't like high temperatures. So um, so with remote light source, just like you know, you put in a you plug it into the wall, you also plug it into a laser. Um, and so this is what this whole thing looks like. Uh, so you have the device level, then you have this, the photonic circuit level, then you have uh, this chiplet, and then this is what it looks like when it's the one that uh, CPU with these chiplets is packaged. So there's a little uh, fiber uh, ribbon here that uh, that takes out this data. But I'll show you what the chiplet looks like over here. So so this is this was this is next to the CPU. So I'll just take this away. This is the electrical interface. This, these are these uh, ring resonator optical, we call them optical the macros, I'll explain, and then the fiber chip coupling. So this thing here just takes electrical signals and basically translates them sort of, there's some protocol and whatever, just translates it to basically voltage that drives each of the modulators. And then here you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight modulators, uh, each of them having sort of these circuits that uh, lock the modulator to its wavelength so that you have an eight wavelength communication system. And the way it works is light enters here with eight wavelengths. 
each of these modulators encodes a different data stream. Let's say you have a, like a one byte comes in at a time. So each bit goes to a different modulator, let's say. So it's parallel, right? Bus goes in here. And uh, so you encode that data and then it comes out. And that's the transmit to the other direction. And then the other guy sends you data and that comes into the receive. And then there's another set of eight detectors here. So this is called one macro. You can do transmit and receive. So let's say right now, this triplet is 32 gigabits per second uh, data speed for each modulator times eight wavelengths. So that's uh, 256 gigabits total times then eight fibers. So there's eight of these replicated across the chip. So you have 24 fibers. And so that's um, that's uh, two terabits per second for one of these triplets. Two, two out, two in. And then you can put 10 of these around so you can get 10 terabits out of one um, chip band. So why is energy important? Energy is important because once you have a terabit per second, if the uh, if this costs you, let's say, 10 picojoules per bit, uh, 10 picojoules per bit times one terabit per second is 10 e minus 12 times one e 12. That's 10 watts, right? And so if you um, it costs you 50 picojoules, it's 50 watts. So um, the point is it scales quickly. So we have 10 terabits times 10, 10 uh, picojoules per bit, which is the typical 20 picojoules per bit, per bit is actually the typical uh, electrical communication cost. That's 200 watts. These CPUs are only a few hundred watts. So you know you're, you're going to eat all of the your energy budget just with the uh, with the communication. Uh, the optics right now is at five, and it can go down to a couple of picojoules. And so that's you know that's uh, that's why uh, we're doing it. why 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 is it low? So one of these little ring resonators is a PN junction, which is a capacitor, like. Uh, uh, you know, PN diode uh, has a depletion region and has a junction capacitance. So when you put a voltage on it, you need to store charge on it. And so the energy that you use to keep the charge there is a half CV squared. And then when you go from a one to a zero, that charge goes, goes gets burned through some resistance. Then you do it again. And so the, the energy per bit is a quarter CV squared because um, half CV squared is the energy, but then Half the time you're not doing transitions when you have random data. You go from a one to a one, from a zero to a zero, right? Anyways, and uh, so if you make this capacitor large, the energy per bit is large. If these uh, modulators are tiny, then the capacitance is tiny, and so the energy per bit to drive this is small. So that's why uh, going from larger optical devices to tiny ones helps you with the energy per bit. And um, so here you can see this laser. Uh, you know there are eight fibers, and each one has eight wavelengths. So one interesting thing about it, I don't want to talk about this in detail, is um, if you uh, want to um, stable stabilize the laser uh, wavelengths against temperature changes, because there might be from fifty to one hundred twenty degrees C, things like that, and these are semiconductors. You know the refractive index changes, self heating effects, whatever. So you might have to put it on a thermoelectric cooler. Once you put it on a thermoelectric cooler, that's a that's a fridge. That's a whole other huge amount of power you're consuming. So we let the lasers float freely, and then the little ring resonators are tracking them. So they're basically at all times following the laser wavelengths, and that's how we get away uh, from the energy costs of of, uh, of keeping laser wavelengths stable. So and, and yeah, this is you can see here, for example, at 20 and 100 degrees C, how much the wavelengths shift, like several channels worth. Um, anyway, so uh, that's you know that's what IO Labs is doing, and um, you know now it's not in these GPUs, but in the next four to five years, these this kind of technology might be, or or it might be out of business, and I'll be back teaching something else. <laughs> but, you know, but but now is the time that this is needed. So I think it's interesting just to share with you that. There is a place where integrated optics and large scale integrated optics, many components on a chip like this, has a relevant place. And you know, there's still, if you go to like optical fiber communication conference, which is a big optical com conference, you know, there's still sort of uh, debates about, you know, whether this, this or that is better, whether integrated optics is needed now or later. But I think nobody doubts 
that uh, optics will have to uh, come in. Sort of electrical solutions have been uh, gone to for, for a while and uh, they're, they're definitely acknowledged to be out of juice. Uh, let me see here. I'm doing time so that I know how to plan mine because I'm, I'm chatty. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, um, oh, yeah. Just uh, so, yeah, a little bit of bragging too. So, so this is here. Well, actually, this is interesting. So, this is two of these light sources. Uh, this is built together with Intel. Let's see. Um, so, this is one of their FPGA chips. And then there are these two chiplets, like I showed you. And so, the light source goes here, goes in here, powers up on these chiplets. And then the chiplet, you can't see it here, but uh, the fiber comes out to this port. And so you just plug in a fiber connector, which is actually a, a fiber array. So it's uh, like uh, uh, the 24 fibers, of that, or actually not 24, some of them are here. So 16 fiber uh, connector, and then that goes between two of these FPGAs. So that was uh, demonstrated last year. And it was actually demonstrated to Joe Biden at the White House <laughs> in November. Uh, there was this American Possibilities demo day, and they picked like six uh, microelectronics uh, technologies. Anyway, so okay, so that's that's what hap is happening at IR Labs, and that's uh, digital data communication using integrated optics. So I'm gonna just give you a high level overview of the RF because I want to spend more time on, on the uh, quantum and superconductors. So with uh, RF technology. Uh, this 560 wireless, uh, people are going to be informing with in, in, in the radio wave uh, regime. So it's 40 gigahertz, 75 gigahertz, um, or 28 or whatever. And so phase array antenna, you know, is, is a device like this where you basically have many elements. And if you phase them up in a certain way, you, uh, you uh, emit all the uh, light in a, in a narrow beam in a certain direction. You can steer that by controlling the phase shifts. So uh, the idea is, you know, you're in a football stadium and there's 10,000 cell phones. And so there's a few towers and they're trying to ma manage all of this traffic. Uh, and everybody's watching videos or recording videos or posting them on Facebook or whatever, you know. So, um, so the idea is uh, you, you have, if you want to do beam forming and you have, let's say, at these high frequencies, this millimeter wave, so the wavelength is a millimeter order. So you have to put the elements a millimeter apart. And the aperture is yay size, let's say. So, you know, a thousand elements, 32 by 32 or something, that's that's actually like that minimum. So a thousand elements, a lot of cables and a lot of control. But moreover, uh, let's say you're receiving a weak signal at this antenna from somewhere. So um, you either have to uh, transmit that signal at 60 gigahertz, that's hard. Uh, electrical signals are lossy, or metals are lossy at these frequencies. So then your other option is to have communication links, like digital optical communication links, like I just, just talked about. But then you have to put an analog to digital converter, a thousand of them, which is going to cost you a thousand A to D converters, and also the power for a thousand A to D converters, and that's on the order of kilowatts. So you have like this little antenna, and then you spend a kilowatt on the A to D converters. And so the idea of uh, this project, and you know, it's a little bit further out, is to use similar kind of wavelength multiplexing. So you have many wavelengths coming here, 16. And then you divide this uh, thousand element array, 32 by 32 um, elements, into little patches of eight by eight elements, that, that's four, that's four. And each patch gets uh, an optical fiber. So this eight by eight, uh, each two rows is actually sort of unwrap into 16, so 16 by four. Anyway, but uh, we, we need the analog signal from each antenna to be imprinted onto a uh, an optical signal and processed somewhere in the central office. And so if you use multiple wavelengths, you don't have so many fibers. And then, okay, maybe it's not realistic to have, I mean, people work on optical frequency combs, so as soon as they make them you know, power efficient, maybe you can have only one fiber and 64 wavelengths. But, in the foreseeable future, maybe 8, 16, 32 wavelengths. So maybe you need to use multiple fibers, but then you need you use um, these ring modulators because they are wavelength selective when uh, in imprinting information. So this modulator tunes to one wavelength will only imprint that the drive signal onto that wavelength. And then the next one will imprint the next antenna element signal onto the next wavelength and so on. And so 
lots of requirements for linearity and so on when you try to transmit an analog signal. That's why it's a hard project. But so we're using coherent detection here. We split the lights, send some of it out here, and then interfere to have a sensitive detection of, of what comes back. Um, so it's sort of tricky because you're both trying to do sensitive detection and high frequency, meaning you want both speed and sensitivity. You don't have a lot of in integration time, but you need to be sensitive. So um, the one thing that I think is interesting about this, just to mention to you, is um, here we use a, a dual cavity modulator. And the reason for that is that this is for an RF signal. It's coming through the air. It's at 60 gigahertz, and maybe it has a few gigahertz bandwidth around. That's unlike uh, data communication at, let's say, 10 gigabits per second from a processor, which is baseband. So it's just ones and zeros. And so if you look at the Fourier spectrum of the data signal of 10 gigabits, it takes up all the frequencies from DC up to 10 gigahertz. But in an RF signal, uh, from zero up to 58 gigahertz is empty. And then from 58 to 62 is where the spectrum is. And then the rest is empty again, right? So it's a narrow band sort of signal. And so if you use a ring modulator, what happens is uh, it has a, a resonance and you need to put both the laser carrier and then the modulator when you drive it at 60 gigahertz, it creates a side band 60 gigahertz away. The higher the frequency, the, the, the further apart these two are. So, but the problem is you want to use a high Q resonator to enhance this process. On the other hand, if you use a high Q resonator, it gets narrow and you can't put either the pump or the sideband in there. So you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. But what we do is we couple two resonators and uh, what happens just like two quantum wells, when you couple them, you split states. Here you couple these, you split resonances. And if you couple them just the right amount, you split by exactly 60 or 70 gigahertz or whatever your carrier frequency is. And then the line width can be as narrow as you as your losses will allow. And you keep enhancing efficiency, conversion efficiency. The only thing that limits you is it is the modulation bandwidth on the RF signal, the you know, the, the data. And that might be a couple of gigahertz. So basically, you want this one to be at least a couple of gigahertz wide, and then this one can be super narrow because the signal coming in is just a CW laser. And, and that's how you squeeze the most out of uh, sort of the resources that you're given you know, with the optics. So that's just um, a little different in, in that regard. And so I'll just show you what we're doing. Uh, yeah, this is just, we'll just skip this. Some um, other things. So this is a low noise amplifier. So the signal comes in. Uh, this is a, a circuit low noise amplifier, and then it drives one of these modulators. And what we're showing here is just um, the noise figure in the final RF link versus the laser power. So, you know, you, you want a low noise figure, you want about 10 dB, we're at 25, so it's not great, but it's the first, first result. So that's um, that's uh, this. And um, uh, this is a three resonators, actually. The middle one is a passive tunable one, so it, it allows us to, to adjust the splitting between uh, these two that are modulator cavities and that are coupled. So that way, uh, because you don't know exactly which frequency the low noise amplifier will peak at, and so you have to make it a little bit adjustable. So that's uh, that's what's going on here. Um, let me see. I probably ran out of time. Uh, hold on a second. It's a one fifty eight. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, so um, I think this is a this is an interesting topic. This. Uh, these cryogenic uh, transmitters, we worked on optical communication links, but for me, the interesting thing is actually the, the bigger picture here. So uh, IARPA, the Intelligence uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, you know, invested a lot of effort into developing uh, cryogenic electronics for different things. They're used in like as radar amplifiers or I don't know, whatever, but these circuits are small scale. There are a few companies that make them based on Joseph's injunctions. There's a guy, Likarev, who started uh, single flux quantum logic based on the, the magnetic flux quantum. Um, and the interesting thing is, so based on Joseph's adductions, instead of you know field effect transistors in silicon, the cool thing is uh, that the energy for one of these things uh, is like seven orders of magnitude lower than CMOS. But it has to work at four Kelvin, so you have to put it in a fridge. When you put something in a fridge and it burns energy, uh, to keep it at four Kelvin, you have to pay a thousand watts powering the fridge for every watt you dissipate in the fridge. 
So, um, so, but that's still three orders of magnitude. So you, you're back to four. And when you, you know, all the non-ideal things and whatever, you, there's still a couple of orders of magnitude to win there. And that's cool. Uh, there, there are foundries for this, like MIT Lincoln Lab has a foundry. You know, these doses and junctions are like 10 by 10 microns. They're not 45 nanometers in size. So like the same size chip would be, you know, the size of a, this room instead of this size. But that's a few generations of, of improving this. And, and, you know, that can be fixed. And so the cool thing then is, can you build a supercomputer out of this? Because the way that uh, the Department of Energy works is they, they go, okay, we have a 20 megawatt budget. Whatever you can do in this budget, go for it. So it's sort of power constrained. You, you put your computer next to a, you know, a, a hydroelectric power plant and, and next to a power dam in, in Oregon and, and go for it. Um, so the question is basically, and, and you know, um, when this research in superconducting logic was starting in the 80s and 90s, people were thinking, well, you know, I'm not going to put like a cryogenic cooler in my laptop, but now everything's in the cloud, so who cares? Like whether it's a rack of lab servers or like, uh, you know, a fridge with stuff in it, it doesn't matter, whatever whatever costs, costs and, and performs better. And so one other interesting data point here, coming back to AI, is... Uh, <laughs> This is this uh, Cerebras wafer scale processor. Uh, that's the size of a wafer. You can see the size of a dinner plate. Uh, so these are all processors and they interconnect them together. And uh, these are made to handle these AI computations. Uh, and same with Tesla, the car, co car company. So they're doing also robotics. And so they do something similar. They do silicon, but then they dice it up uh, into um, dyes. And uh, because of yield issues, they find all the good dyes and then they put them back into a wafer just so that they have better performance, but same idea. And so the way this works is, you know, they have all these uh, tiles that are connected together at high bandwidth. And what this means is all the people working on computer architecture, uh, they've moved to having the processors all together and the memory disaggregated outside. So here's a DRAM memory outside. And so the point is all the computer architectures already are separating all the compute and all the memory. So with the superconducting logic, the problem is you can't build a, a computer because you put a, a zillion transistors based on superconducting logic uh, in a 4K bridge, but there's no superconducting memory. Or there is, you know, there are nature papers on superconducting memories, but it's like 8 bits, 64 bits. To do a supercomputer, you need terabytes, not, you know, and one of these little chips in your computer is 4 gigabytes, not 8 bits. So for any, any reasonable uh, computer system, you, you need DRAM memory, which is semiconductor. So, but now you can just put all the compute in the fridge, and as long as you can talk to the outside memory at reasonable energy cost, that's fine. You put a bunch of electrical cables, you saw how many cables it takes to, uh, to get bandwidth out. Um, that's metal, that conducts heat out, that costs you more in the thousand watts per watt problem. So it's not, but if you have optical fiber, that's great. That's an insulator, huge amount of bandwidth. The only problem is uh, superconducting logic. Voltage levels are not one volt like CMOS. They're two millivolts, these single flux common things. And so you have to make the uh, modulators very, very sensitive. So anyway, so that was the, you know, the part, do optical links. And um, so that, let's skip this stuff. Basically, so we have a coherent link where the light goes into the fridge uh, this superconducting logic, three to five millivolts, drives a little tiny amplifier, just a few transistors, and goes from three millivolts up to 100 millivolts. And then the, we optimize this modulator to be able to work at 100 millivolts. And that was the idea. And uh, I'm just going to skip the circuit. But um, uh, this is so this is a superconducting chip driving one of these. Uh, things uh, with a four millivolt signal and, and you can see the you know the ones and zeros outside in the optical fiber. So it is sort of that was a demonstration that we can do this. Um, and, and this was in silicon because uh, you have the control to make these um, these uh, components so you can have many wavelengths and components. Um, okay so I think I guess stop here maybe or can I give you the overview of the quantum thing in about five minutes what do you think maybe I'll let people leave who need to leave or ask a question or two yeah I have a boring question if that's okay uh so slide 14 oh yeah 
Yep. <laughs> um, so you mentioned this kind of hybrid CMOS and silicon photonics platform. Now, my limited knowledge of M7 and smaller technos places density requirements on these transistors. And my question then is, I mean, I assume you're using some kind of planar CMOS technology. Have you come to terms with the density requirements you have to place on the transistors? Then also the effects that this might place in your office to sort of think of less space. Yeah, it's a very quick question. So, so the question was in seven nanometer transistor technology, PSMC, um, you have you put you have to trans have transistors at cer a certain density because like uh, silicon versus no no silicon, uh, sort of the average density would be about the same because they do certain polishing steps, so they don't want dishing in wafers and whatever big weird things. Um, so um, first of all, we are in 45 nanometer technology, which is much larger. And uh, these rules for density exist, but these are planar MOSFETs rather than thin FETs, which is the seven nanometer. Um, the, uh, I'll mention why that's important. So this is silicon on insulator, which makes it easy to make waveguides because you have an oxide underneath. Uh, and um, for density uh, issues, the density fill, which is dummy silicon, basically, which people already put in places. So it just means, you know, your ring resonator is there doing guiding light, but then there are a bunch of silicon squares inside it and also on the side, and you just sort of make sure that it passes this these average density requirements and all that. I mean, for a single experiment, of course, you don't have to do that and you can get the rule wave, but um, but if you want something to, to have sort of high consistency and not bring tools down because of slivers of silicon falling off the, the wafer and stuff like that, then, then you have to meet these rules and you can using this kind of thing. Uh, N7 though, and these sort of very uh, uh, advanced process nodes, they are bulk silicon wafers, meaning there's just silicon, and then the transistors are in the silicon, not on an insulator. But then, so, like, that, so then there's not an easy way to, to put integrated optics in, and actually that's what we're doing here. We, this is an approach to do this in these advanced nodes, where, where anyway, we can talk about that after. But um, uh, so, um, you can, I think, in principle, put photonics next to uh, seven nanometer transistors. Whether you would want to do that, different story. And so, uh, it could be that this goes from monolithic back to separate electronic and optical chips, because there's a lot of work now in industry being put into advanced packaging that can make the mating between these very uh, low capacitance, so kind of tiny, sort of uh, bump pads. And that was the reason for us to go monolithic, that you have these huge pads, lots of parasitic capacitance. So I mentioned before that the energy per bit has to do with, you know, this ring modulator having a tiny capacitance, for example. And so the quarter CD squared that you burn per bit is that capacitance, but not, that's like 10 femtofarads, let's say. But now you have a 250 femtofarad pad that has a big solder ball and another 250 femtofarad pad. And that your electronic driver is driving through that. Now you 25x the the um, energy that it takes. But uh, this advanced packaging is making this much smaller, and so you know it might it might be fine for certain applications. So, so yeah, that, that answer. No, no, no. Um, hey, since you stuck around, I'm gonna give you just a. Quick overview of what we're doing in quantum optics. Um, that was over. Here. Yeah. So, um, so the uh, there's a lot of work in quantum optics trying to uh, generate uh, source uh, or build sources of a, a quantum light, as John Sykes' group and some of the rest of you maybe work on, uh, as well as. Then I was just visiting Xanadu, so people trying to build quantum computers, you know, uh, of this technology to single photon detectors, these kind of things. Uh, the angle that I took into this just to learn more about quantum optics was, can I just take the simplest, simplest thing and try to get it to a level where we can do something sort of semi-useful? Like, um, so um, 
we can do generate photon pairs with a ring resonator, but the problem is it takes a lab of equipment around that ring resonator just to tune it, to give it laser light, all these things to filter out all the Raman noise and all these things, you know, it's sort of, uh, uh, so can we basically put an entire little system on a chip that you just push the button and out come photon pairs and you can use them in the lab uh, or in some test bed uh, or whatever. And so, um, so, uh, you know, a ring resonator can use, um, you pump green light and you get out a red and a blue photon using four-way mixing, or this is all in the infrared region, I guess, for a green, red, and blue. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so you think, okay, so a ring resonator is, is a photon pair source, but it's not really because, you know, it's sort of... Uh, laser light comes in, you have to tune the ring to the frequency of the laser, that's thermal tuning. You need to know whether it's at that wavelength, so you need to sense whether there's light in there and uh, put it to some control system to be able to lock that. If you pump too hard and you're using silicon, you have two photon absorption or you have self-heating effects. Uh, these self-heating effects make this sort of a bistable cavity, so to get the, the highest convert efficiency is not so trivial. Then the other part is um, if you send CW light, you get correlated uh, photons. And for some applications, you might want uh, un or um, uh, factorizable states. So then you have to send in a pulse. That pulse has to be tuned exactly sort of to the right pulse length, you know, to make this uh, factorizable. Uh, you might have some uh, amplified spontaneous emission. It's not a CW perfect uh, sinusoidal waveform that a laser is. So you have to filter out the noise, then, then pump this cavity, then when it comes out, there's some pump left, so you have to reject this, this pump. Turns out it's a classical pump, there's only two single photons here. It's not so easy to get rid of that light. And so we wanted to see if we can put do this all on a single chip. Um, so this is from a while back, just putting a source and a pump filter um, with about 100 dB rejection, where we could uh, basically put in light, uh, generate photon pairs, filter out the pump, and use the pairs um, directly without off-chip filtering, which was, so I think the first time that was the case um, uh, without the aid of filters. Uh, and then this is a, uh, um, a fact and from a quantum interference uh, demonstration. Uh, so, but this is all passive. So this is just uh, cavities. Uh, the reason, yeah, we can talk later why there's many um, and so where we are now is just like that uh, optical communication system, we have circuits that uh, tune these cavities. So light goes in here, passes through a bandpass filter so that all the amplified spontaneous emission is filtered. Then it goes to a nominated cavity, which produces the pairs. Then each of the generated pairs comes out through a filter here and the pump is uh, taken away. And so, uh, I'll just show you here how it looks like. Uh, so this system, what it's doing is it's scanning uh, A to B converter. And this here is the photo current and it goes up that so you're sensing how much light there is in the uh, ring width. And um, so what happens is over here, um, there's a self heating effect. So as you uh, tune the resonator through the cavity, uh, as it heats, its refractive index is moving, and so the resonance is shifting. So there's a bistable condition, and it snaps at some point. And then, so basically, then, then this thing figures that out, goes back, knows what where that sweet spot is, and locks, and, and uh, maximizes the pair generation. So this is about, let's say, 20,000 pairs um, per second out, outside the chip. Uh, and the coincidence to accidentals ratio, which is like signal noise ratio, about 40 or 50. Uh, it's actually not the newest one. Uh, and I'll end, I just have two slides left here to show you. Uh, so yeah, this is by the way, what these experiments look like. So there's the chip that we have, and then these circuits do something on here, but we have to talk to them. So, so we have a little board that we plug in. So there's an, like an FPGA that, that programs this and tells it what to do. So you can, from MATLAB or Python or whatever, uh, talk to it. Uh, let me skip these things, just details. So the, the resonator 
uh, has built in PN diodes so that when the pump light is going through, if there's two photon absorption, we, we extract the carriers so that we don't get additional free carrier absorption um, from carriers hanging around in the plasma absorbing light. And then there's some sweet spot uh, for, for maximizing the power. Um, but let me just show you uh, the interesting part. So, okay, so this was this locking. And then the other part is, so what we really want is to have like a little building block here and then turn on like 10 of these sources and be able to multiplex so that you can improve the uh, rate at which you're getting heralded photons or whatever it is that you're, you know, sort of uh, the guy from Nist Gatesburg, I forget his name now, uh, who proposed this first, uh, uh, Alan Migdal, his scheme, for example. Um, so, so here we have 12 of these. And the point is, you know, when you're thermally tuning one of them, this thermal crosstalk to the others. And so what you want is to lock one of these guys. And then what we're doing is um, turning on and off these other ones and showing that it's stable. And then if you turn off the, uh, the feedback locking, then we see where I'm showing that, oh, I don't actually have it here. Well, so, or I, I'm not seeing it, but if you turn it off, then, then you know, it goes haywire is the point. Um, so anyway, that, that's what we're doing with this. And um, uh, the, I guess the other part we've spent some time on just most recently is just trying to make sure that what we're predicting and what we're measuring makes sense and are corresponding to each other. And we're getting pretty close with that. So one thing that we still struggle with some of these chips is figuring out where some Raman generation is coming from. It's a, I don't know whether it's, you know, because in a CMOS platform, there are these nitrides that are there because of uh, uh, sort of stress management in, in transistors and stuff. You know, there's all kinds of materials uh, that are there. So that's kind of the, the long, uh, the short story of it. I don't want to, uh, yeah, this is a newer, newer chip that uh, fixes some of the problems that, that we had in the previous one. So we haven't um, measured it yet, but that's, that's where we are. So um, thanks for giving me a chance to, to tell you what, what I've been working on and what we're doing. And yeah, I'd love to find out what's going on here more. And I guess if, A, if you're in Washington, DC, which is where I live, believe it or not, uh, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, or if you're in Boston sometime, you know, happy to have you visit uh, my group. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions?